Hello and welcome to Never Down Applications with Oracle Maximum Availability Architecture. My name is Markus Michalewicz and I am Vice President of Product Management for Oracle Database High Availability, Scalability and Oracle Maximum Availability Architecture. And today I want to talk about how to establish Never Down Applications with the Oracle Database. But before I go in media threes, let me ask you, what do you think is the biggest challenge for never down applications? In my opinion, the biggest challenge for providing never down applications is application state management. Think about it. In order to ensure never down applications, the application state needs to be maintained during planned outages and needs to be restored after unplanned outages. And of course, Oracle has a recommendation of what to do in this regard. And the recommendation is to keep your application stateless or state safe, which means server side applications should be stateless in that there is no state to be maintained between two API and REST codes, for example. Then in addition, the recommendation is to keep application state in tables within the database because that eliminates the need for applications to manage the state, as mentioned, but it also simplifies the life cycle management, the high availability, and the disaster recovery, which is exactly what we will be talking about in course of this presentation. Now, of course, we understand that sometimes applications just have to maintain state outside of the database, for example, caches, in which case we recommend that you make sure that those um, applications use a state safe way of managing state, which means the state can be reconstituted from database tables, for example. A stateless application makes more efficient use of database resources also. Any database connection can be used for any application or user, and normally is light, it's of lighter weight and you can use much fewer connections. However, if I talk about putting your application state in an Oracle database or in a database in, in, into tables within a database. I'm specifically talking about pluckable databases as far as the Oracle database is concerned. Pluckable databases have been introduced a while ago and originally they were introduced as database containers for consolidation. And this is still a great use case, but they also provide a lot of means to provide an online database lifecycle operation or set of operations. And if you want to know more about multi-tenant, I've given you a link to more information about Oracle multi-tenant, which basically is a description of pluckable databases. It's an option to the Oracle Enterprise Edition. But you can use up to three PDBs for free in the Oracle Enterprise Database, Enterprise Edition database, which means pluckable databases are really convenient for a simplified database lifecycle management for never down applications. And the reason is because they can accommodate for the very common steps in a typical database lifecycle circle or flow. The four steps are the creation of the application and then the testing of which followed by integration testing and eventually production. And I want to walk you through these four steps very quickly and show you how pluckable databases can help you to efficiently manage that life cycle for never down applications. Obviously, it starts with the creation. So you have an application that you want to develop and you put your application state into the pluckable database. You develop a database application in that pluckable database. Once you are at a certain state, you want to start testing and you can easily then use rapid deployment with hot cloning to provide as many test environments as you want, either in the same container database, which is the database that contains the pluckable databases, or other databases, other container databases in your estate. Now, notice that I said hot cloning, which means without impacting the production environment, without impacting your development environment, this is where we came from. And once you then have tested your application just long enough, you can move into the integration stage testing. Now, a lot of our customers, when they do this, they want to not only test on test data or development data, they really want to get the data from a 
designated or even the production system, for which reason you can actually create a pluggable database with a refresh incremental refresh option. So instead of just hot cloning it and have a point in time copy, you can make it so that the pluggable database will be refreshed or incrementally refreshed on a regular basis. So you always get the latest data from the source system from which you copied this pluggable database so that you can test for integration purposes, for example, on very fresh and um, state of the art data. Once that test is sufficient, you probably want to move your application into production at some point in time. And you can either do this yet again by cloning, or you can move a relocation with no down, downtime, which is something that our some of our customers do. They go from integration without downtime into production. And then you have the application in production, and eventually the circle closes because there is an application upgrade required or a database upgrade is required. Staying with the database upgrade, you can easily unplug and pluck the pluckable database into a new container database of the higher version of the database, so the version that you would like your pluckable database to assume. And then you have a new version, and as you continue developing applications on that pluckable database, the circle will repeat itself. For that reason, pluckable databases provide a very simplified database lifecycle management for never down application because they help a lot with certain operations that you need to perform in course of the circle or cycle. Now, the other question then is, this is great. This is how do you protect your database from failures? And what if I have a production system that really doesn't allow me to take down the database for any sort of um, planned or unplanned maintenance or um, failures? And the answer to that question is Oracle's Maximum Availability Architecture, or in short, MAA. Oracle MAA provides a standardized reference architecture set for never down deployments. And when I talk about standardized reference architectures, I'm referring to the left side of this picture here, where I show four levels, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And as you go up the level of metal, so to speak, you increase the level of protection. So the assumption here is that MAA provides you with very clear definitions of database configuration that have a certain SLA, and these SLA are leveled bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. The other base assumption, what MAA does, is illustrated in the middle of that slide here, by which we show you the typical setup and what MAA does to ensure um, maximum availability. Because MAA is a long-standing project in Oracle database. It has been around for over 20 years. And for that period of time, it has taken customer insights and expert recommendations, which we then use to continuously validate and improve new features and configurations and to provide you with HA feature configurations as well as operational best practices. And the typical setup around which we provide those configurations and operational best practices is shown here. You have a production site, and then ideally you have a replicated site, by which means you're already more in the silver or gold level. So the silver level would assume you have a production site, you have a backup in there that you perform on a regular basis, and you probably have a cluster. In my picture here, this cluster would be uh, represented by the Exadata engineered system, symbolized by the X. If you then want to protect yourself and the database against disaster recovery, you would want to replicate your data across distance to a replicated site, and that's symbolized here, by which you enter the gold standard already. An MA is very flexible. You don't need to use engineered systems. I've just shown them here in this picture. MA can be deployed on generic systems, on engineered systems, and of course, our cloud deployments BaseDB, ExaDB, or ExaCloud customer will benefit from MAA. In the cloud, MAA is part of the operations and the architecture. In engineered systems, part of the architecture and autonomous database, which is the highest level of integration, it's autonomous, autonomous, autonomously integrated for you. By the way, if you want to move from, for example, generic systems into the cloud on ExaDB or ExaCC, or into the autonomous database. We even use MAA then, 
as part of zero downtime migration, ZDM, so you can move from one deployment to the other, maintaining the availability of the database that you want to migrate. For that reason, MA continuously improves, and that's shown on the right side here of this picture. We have been covering a lot of functional areas with MA. We started out talking about availability and scale out, for example. And these are the two bottom boxes that you can see here. We still focus on scaling out and life cycle with MA. Typical features and products you would use in this context are RAC, FPP, and charting. FPP stands for feed patching and provisioning. And of course, we use active replication, and I already mentioned um, the replication part. If I was to mention it in terms of products, active data guard would be one of the solutions to be named here. The other one is Golden Gate. There's more solutions that we have, for example, for data protection. We have flashback, which helps you to recover from logical mistakes. And we have Armon, which is basically the main tool to provide, uh, to take and provide backups and recovery sets, and the advanced functionality ZDLRA. Last but not least, and a stronger focus over the recent years has been continuous availability. And in this area, we are using technologies such as application continuity, online redefinition, and edition-based redefinition to provide continuous availability for your applications. So MA has really become more than just a database protection mechanism and really focuses on providing never down deployments. For that matter, I would like to focus on the hidden gems of Oracle MA today. So Oracle MA components that really help you achieve never down applications. And the three that I've chosen here is uh, our application continuity, in the context of continuous availability, active replication, and then active data guard as part of the products in this area. And last but not least, I wanna to touch on sharding for the purpose of talking about scaling out and protecting your data in very massive databases. Last but not least, I wanna talk about a new product, a new feature, but it's really a product on the Oracle Cloud, full stack disaster recovery. It's a service provided that brings all these features together and ensures a full stack disaster recovery, but we'll come to that later. Now, the first feature that was listed here on that slide was application continuity. And application continuity is basically one solution that comes in two flavors. The base solution is application continuity, and it's very flexible. It helps you to ensure hence the name application continuity, for a lot of use cases. However, there's a second flavor called transparent application continuity, which aims to do the same except in a transparent way. And there's not a lot of difference between these two solutions. Both of them work for plant maintenance and unplanned outages. They are both available with Oracle Rack and Active Data Guard. But the difference is in the last bullet on the picture here and on either side because application continuity, while it is very flexible and configurable, requires an Oracle connection pool, whereas transparent application continuity, TAC, does not. And that's the reason why it's actually the default on Oracle Autonomous Database. Oracle Autonomous Database can be used with a lot of applications. Not always would we know whether that application uses a connection pool. So we use transparent application continuity as the default if someone wants to connect to the Oracle Autonomous Database. So what does transparent application continuity do in that context? Well, it hides database server failures from your application. More precisely, it hides database downtime from your user, and it sits right between, as a picture on the right would show, it sits right between the database and your application, and basically ensures that if there's an outage scenario on the database, your application and hence your users wouldn't be affected, wouldn't be seeing those. In more professional terms, TAC or transparent application continuity rebuilds the session state and replaces in flight transactions as part of the automated session failure. So, should a failure occur on the database, your session is automatically reconnected to another instance in, in my case here, that database cluster. The session state, thanks to TAC and functionality on the database site, the session state is reinstated, and even transactions that have started but yet not committed, 
and were in flight at the moment of failure, will be replayed in the destination instance and hopefully come to a successful end for your users. By that matter, TSC eliminates errors unless unrecoverable. So there are certain errors which we cannot recover, whether for plant maintenance and unplanned outages. Now, don't worry about it. There is actually a tool, which I'll show you in a moment, which will tell you which errors will be discovered and how, so you don't have to worry about the protection level. You can easily determine that. And if everything works out, then what TAC does is it will ensure that there will be no outages during, or no exceptions during outages for your application. Without TAC, however, there may be exceptions, and I'm sure you will be familiar with those. Underneath the covers, we use a technology that's called fast application notification, fan, and draining to achieve this kind of feature, this kind of behavior. Fan in this context is a solution that notifies clients of database status changes. So instead of waiting for the client to determine that there is an outage on the database layer, we will inform the client that can either be the driver or the connection pool for TAC at least, we will inform the client about changes such as failures on the database layer, and then the client together with the database will do what I formally described, will go to another instance and reinstate the session and the, fly, and the transactions that were in flight. Draining, on the other hand, is more a feature that helps us plan maintenance. Basically, it allows to reduce or cause the sessions to complete their work on a given instance to prepare the node or the database for maintenance. You do not want to perform maintenance on an instance or node while the database node or instance is under full workload. You really want to drain it down, lower it down, and then move the remaining workload if it didn't drain in time to another instance so you can conveniently patch the node that requires or the instance that requires maintenance. Oracle TAC is best used with Oracle Database 19C, including 19C drivers. And if you do can make use of a connection pool, we highly recommend that, even though for transparent application continuity, that wouldn't be required. For application continuity, it will be required. And whether you need to go to application continuity, you can easily determine with AC check, because AC check is a tool that helps to determine the protection provided by TAC. It will also tell you the protection level provided by AC, but for the purpose of my session, I will be focusing on what it does for TAC. And as a side effect, AC Check also catches applications that use coding practices that may perhaps prevent safe replays. The, the AC Check report, which I'm showing here in the screenshot, is available to you via the DBMS underscore app continuity um, report package. It's available since Oracle Database 19C, I think 1911 is the minimum RU. And if you use 19C, you can easily run AC check either together with the application you want to assess or after a dedicated or production run of that application. AC check will then go to data that is stored inherently in the database statistics metadata and gather information about the transactions that have been performed during that application run. And then it will list the application transactions that it has determined and tell you exactly what the result would be to what level it would either replay a transaction, which means you will be covered. There shouldn't be any errors, even if there's an outage. It will also tell you, however, that it sometimes cannot replay um, a transaction and that is then an unrecoverable error. But if it does so, it will tell you by means of the error code why a replay of that particular transaction wouldn't be possible. And the error code is basically a disable reason. For example, ORA, ORA41429, which means a side effect is detected. And it makes perfect sense. If you think about it, transparent application continuity can really only assess the transaction that it sees. Some of those transactions may what we have what we would call autonomous transactions, for example. So a transaction that is embedded in a transaction, that is a problem that TAC cannot replay because we wouldn't have control over the embedded transaction. Another very co common example for a transaction that would be disabled for replay, so wouldn't be automatically recovered, would be one of those that uses external callouts. 
for example, based on DBMS Util. DBMS Util is a package in the database that allows you to reach out to external sources, file systems, URLs for web services, for example. And if you make the result of that DBMS Util call part of a transaction, then that transaction would not be recoverable by TAC because we cannot control the success of that external callout initiated by DBMS Util. Now, if you really want that to be handled and if you want to give us instructions on how that should be handled, then AC, application continuity, would be the solution of your choice. And that is the reason why we have two flavors of application continuity, application continuity itself and transparent application continuity. That was a lot of theory and I'm aware of this. So let's not go into further details, but instead let's give a Let's look at a demo how transparent application continuity works. And I've asked my colleague Sinan to prepare a demo for us. So please, Sinan, take it from here. For this demo, we use the windows on the top right side of the screen to manage the services needed for the applications to connect to the database. We create the first service with the transparent application continuity enabled. This will be used by the application on the top left side. The service runs on both instances of a two-node rack database. The second database service without transparent application continuity enabled will be used by the application on the bottom left side. This service also runs on both database instances. On the bottom right side, we have a single user using the recommended connection string and the transparent application continuity enabled service. As it also uses the scan listener and the service runs on both instances, the connection can be established to either instance. In this case, the connection goes to instance number one. Please keep this number in mind for later. The user buys a movie, but leaves for lunch without committing the transaction. In the middle window on the right, we will query the total number of sessions connected to the database. At this moment, it is only that one connection to instance one. Now the application using the transparent application continuity enabled service starts using a connection pool. 50 users log in, spread across both database instances and start executing transactions. On the screen, we also see the number of transactions per second over time. The application using the service without transparent application continuity also starts using a connection pool. Here again, 50 users log in, spread across both database instances, and start executing transactions. The events tab on the left side of each application shows information and messages coming from the database. At this moment, it shows that all users are logged in. Now it is time to patch node number one. So we need to stop the database services running on that node to free it up for maintenance. When we stop the transparent application continuity enabled service on node one, the application using this service doesn't get any error messages and is not interrupted by any means. However, when we stop the service without a transparent application continuity enabled, end users are interrupted and errors appear on the application side. Instance 2 continues serving both applications. We also see this in the number of transactions per second continues to be similar to what it was before. While stopping the service was completely transparent for the application using a transparent application continuity. Finally, the single user comes back from lunch, even though the service on instance one has been stopped. Meanwhile, the commit completes successfully and transparently to the user. Now connected to instance two, without any interruptions, thanks to transparent application continuity. As you can see, transparent application continuity helps you to hide database failures and outages planned or unplanned 
from your application. Now, another hidden gem that I've mentioned in the beginning is Active Data Guard. Oracle Active Data Guard is a solution that a lot of you will know because it has been in the Oracle database for the longest time for the purpose of providing zero data loss, disaster recovery across any distance. And as with the previous solution, application continuity, it comes in two flavors, if you so want, as Data Guard, which is part of the Oracle Database Enterprise Edition and Active Data Guard, which is an option to the Enterprise Edition, but both make protection against site outages simple. Data Guard in itself prevents data loss and downtime by maintaining one or more replicated databases using in-memory replication. That is a huge benefit of Data Guard because we don't use storage replication. We perform a replication over the network in memory in that a parallelized process applies redo from the primary database here shown on the left side of the picture on the standby database here shown on the right side of the picture called active standby, ensuring read consistency in and across both sides. So you really, you get an asset compatible solution. You don't have to worry whether you replicate over short or longer distance. And that's exactly perhaps one of the differences between Data Guard and Active Data Guard, because Active Data Guard provides better return on investment of the standby database through, for example, backups and read mostly workload offloading. Data Guard and Active Data Guard provide a block identical copy of the database. So you can easily use the Active Standby to take backups that later on can be applied to the primary should that need ever arise. But more so, the active standby database in an active data guard environment is open for read mostly access. Read mostly means you can run a report against the active standby, but you can also run certain updates ever since DML redirection called um, data, ma data manipulation language redirection was introduced with one of the later Oracle database versions. Um, that feature allows you to perform certain updates on the standby, which will be redirected against the primary and then go via redo back into the standby. It's a very good feature for occasional updates. Let's assume your um, application has a report requirement every quarter, but in the end of that report, uh, report requirement, you would need to write an update to the data. You can now do this entirely on the active standby database. The second feature in the list of Active Data Guard is auto automated block corruption identification and repair. And that's exactly what it does. Active Data Guard allows you to not only identify a corruption, probably you wouldn't need Data Guard for that because your application will likely tell you if there's a corruption in the database, which likely wasn't even caused by the database, but it came in while data files were on rest on storage, for example. Active Data Guard will not only tell you that there is a corruption, it will also automatically repair it for you. And how that looks, we'll have, um, we will see in a demo later on. The other feature that Active Data Guard provides is zero data loss across any distance. And we use a component called Fastsync for that matter, which basically stores redo um, closer to the primary in a synchronized fashion. So you sync redo to the Fastsync so that after the fastsync, you can spend, spend uh, or spread longer distances using asymmetric replication. And if you want to um, know about more about fastsync, please um, reach out to me later, and we will uh, provide you with respective information. Last but not least, rolling database upgrades for ma plant maintenance are also possible with Active Data Guard, making it a more complete solution also for plant maintenance operations. Now, I spoke about plackable databases prior in this presentation, and one of the things I want to say is that Active Data Guard and Data Guard have historically operated on the database as a whole. So when plackable databases in course of multi-tenant were introduced with the Oracle database, then the question arised, what happens if I have plackable data? And that is exactly why we introduced a new feature which allows you to manage data guard on a per workload basis. And that feature is called per PDB data guard. 
So unlike data guard and active data guard as previously described, per PDB data guard doesn't work on the container database itself, but on the pluggable databases within the container database. Which means you have two container databases, CDBs, that are actively running workload as, illust as illustrated here on the right in my picture. You have a primary CDB on the left and you have a primary CDB on the right. Those are primary because the PDBs within each of these container databases are the level on which PDB data guard operates. So in other words, PDB per PDB data guard provides a disaster protection at PDB level. And I've tried to illustrate this here. We have three PDBs in each primary CDB. Doesn't need to be this. You can have asymmetrical settings, but we have unprotected PDBs, which are the ones on the outer ends, the light blue and the light green ones. And then we have two PDBs, the gray and the red one, which are source and target PDBs, just the direction is inversed. So the red one goes from the left primary to the right, and the gray one goes from the right primary to the left, symbolizes source PDB and target PDB in each case. And that disaster protection at PDB level is provided to you in real time apply. So there is no downgrading from the container-based solution from the established active and uh, active data guard solution. It means also that you don't need to fail over the full container should there be a need to fail over because of a failure. The road transition can be performed on a single PDB2, which means if you want to switch over the role from one primary to another, you can do this with the data guard broker. It wouldn't affect any other PDB in the container. And we also provide features such as automatic gap fetching from the source. So should there ever be a gap, we will not conclude either the fade over or the switch over prior to that gap being closed so that your destination uh, PDB is always up to date. So active data guard and per PDB data guard really help enhancing the MAA architecture and the solutions within. One of those solutions, and I mentioned that earlier, is sharding. Sharding is one of the features that became part of MA only later. It only is part of the Oracle database since I believe Oracle database 12C. And it's a solution that allows you to divide and conquer your databases, especially when those databases are large, very large actually. Because sharding is a globally distributed or distributable, massively scaling database architecture and some of our customers have told us that they prefer, because of their applications, to scale globally and or to divide massive databases into smaller farms of databases or farms of smaller databases. These smaller databases are known as shards in the context of sharding. And the way you would establish that is fairly simple. Assume you have a typical table family consisting of a consumer um, application, customers, orders, line items. As you can see here in the picture of the right, in each table, you have the customer information, the orders, and the line items. Now, what you would do when you use sharding, you would partition and distribute that data so that it wouldn't be residing in only one table, but be spread out across different um, tables in different databases in shards and hence these tables are called sharded tables and the benefit here is very simple um, you can spread out data for that data to be closer for example if you have customers in certain geographical regions you may want to have those data closer to them um, another way of defining it could be customers buying different products so you divide up the data by products but if you do so then the, the other information the orders that those customers um, place and the line items need to be in, uh, uh, need to be in, need to be aligned accordingly. On the other hand, what customers order are products. So products don't the products table, the reference table for those products that these customers order doesn't need to be spread out. On the contrary, you don't want it to be spread out. You want to make sure that each database has a copy, so the access to any reference table is very fast, is in the same database and doesn't need to be re uh, requested from a remote database. 
Those tables you duplicate in sharding, so you have them duplicated into each shard across the three that I've shown here, and that's how that picture concludes. If you do this, what you basically indirectly do is you avoid scalability and availability issues with very large databases because you can break the data down in much smaller databases and have many of them. And in addition to that, and that's where MAA provides a holistic approach to this, you can replicate charts with data guard or golden gate. You can also use native SQL. You don't have to change the SQL that queries that data. The only difference is that you want to have your application provide a sharding key that allows us to redirect your SQL to up to a thousand shards. So when your application connects to this sharded database, you still maintain a logical view of the data, which we support with cross sharding queries. But you also want your application to give up a sharding key for each query so that we can route this application query that request to the database that contains the data which the query wants to um, wants to access. And that data is identified by the sharding key, which means that sharding key was also the one that you used to spread out the data. So ge geographically distributed customers was the example, or customers um, ordering different kinds of products. Don't worry, if you ever need to change anything, let's assume you get more customers in new regions or you get more products and you want to reshuffle the setup of your sharded database, you can do so online because we allow online addition in and re reorganization of those shards. With that, it should be clear that sharding is really a solution for linear scalability and extreme availability. Linear scalability because you can add shards online to increase database size and throughput, and thereby be uh, establish an online elasticity. Extreme availability because it's a shared nothing ar hardware architecture, which means if there's a failure to one shard, it wouldn't be affecting the other shards. So if you have 10 equally distributed shards um, in your sharded database and you lose one, you logically lose only a tenth of the data. Of course, that may not be acceptable to many of our customers for which you can protect that chart with Data Guard or Golden Gate. Last but not least, you can spread out your data across geographic regions, or more precisely, you can use geographic distribution. And you can do this on user defined data placement for performance availability or to meet regularly. Uh, regulatory requirements. The letter has become very interesting to a lot of our financial services customers who need to ensure data sovereignty with sharding. Well, they don't need to use sharding for that matter, but sharding helps to establish the same. You can use sharding to put data into different geographic regions across the world, America, Europe, Asia, and it's ensure that this data will reside in the respective region, in the respective country, even though you still maintain a logical view and you can cross the entirety of your data using Oracle Sharding. Now, one of the things that despite sharding is still a very problematic issue is corruption. Corruption cannot be automatically recovered by a shard, because the shard in itself would be part of corruption, for example, or could be subject to a corruption. But luckily, we have Active Data Guard. And as I mentioned before, Active Data Guard has a feature that's called corrupt, corruption identification and automatic repair. And if you protect your shard, as shown here, the one, for example, in Europe that is subject to, uh, to a corruption, if you protect that shard with Active Data Guard, you can make use of exactly that feature to not only identify the corruption, as I said, that typically happens, but to repair it automatically so this shard would not even appear as to be corrupted to the application using. And again, this is easier shown than described. So please, Ludovico, show us how corruption identification automatic repair works with Active Data Guard. Hi, everyone. For this demo, I have a window on top with the primary alert log and two windows with the primary and the standby database in active data card configuration. Uh, the primary contains the table regions with a few records. 
And the standby database uses Active Data Guard real-time query, which is required for automatic lock recovery. So I can query the same table and get the same results. Now, I corrupt the block on the disk containing the data of the table regions on the primary. But because DataGuard does not use storage replication, the block on the standby database is still good. If I query the data on the primary, as we can see in the alert log, the database detects the corruption, but it fixes it automatically by getting a good copy from the standby database. In a normal situation, my select would return an error, but thanks to active data guard automatic block repair, it keeps selected without getting any error. Thank you, Ludovico. As you can see, sharding and data guard, active data guard in particular, build a good combination. Speaking of good combination, the last item I want to talk about today is full stack disaster recovery, because so far we have learned a lot how MAA can protect your database, which configurations you can use to protect your database within MAA. But it's not just the database that helps or is needed to be considered when it comes to disaster recovery. The application and infrastructure is equally part of this consideration, at least so it should be. And that is the reason why we have introduced Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Full Stack Disaster Recovery. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Full Stack Disaster Recovery is a fully managed disaster recovery DR service providing DR for the entire application stack. It's an orchestrated or provides an orchestrated single click DR for infrastructure, applications, and databases. So the whole stack is covered and it automates the DR plan creation, execution, monitoring, and therefore you have a unified management that provides you with a validated and monitored execution of disaster recovery plans through an integrated user interface as well as API. And that makes it much easier for you, for example, to test and run DR plans before disaster ever hits. Hopefully it won't. Some of the features that full stack disaster recovery provides is business continuity for applications, not just the infrastructure. There's a whole, of in, a whole bunch of infrastructure components that we need to consider when it comes to the R. The, uh, full stack disaster recovery considers all of them, but also the database and any application on top of it. It's also very flexible in that it allows a lot of flexibility to manage any DR topology. It's serverless, it has no or low maintenance at least, and you can choose a DR topology for each protection group, which means for each of your application, including database and infrastructure. A protection group, for example, can manage DR for infrastructure only, the infrastructure and the database, or all three infrastructure, database, and applications to together. It provides business continu uh, continuity using a single pane of glass. You don't have to go anywhere, just go to Oracle Cloud, and it is a cloud-only feature as of this moment. We are looking to expand, but right now it's an OCI Oracle Cloud infrastructure feature. Under migration and disaster recovery, you will find disaster recovery, the uh, DR protection groups, and you can use that click to then create a DR plan for a given set of components. Now, when I say you can do this, it's a single click, fully automated DR. You don't have to move around. You can you know, choose from predefined DR plans. We are working on enhancing though. And you can even customize um, your DR plans. You can use custom intelligence automatically building complex DR plans. So in other words, if you add components to your, to your, DR, to your DR protection group, full stack disaster recovery will look at the group and the components within and will advise what else needs to be covered to make that DR protection complete. So you wouldn't be leaving any component behind should a DR um, case ever occur. Of course, you can customize the DR plans to, su to, su suit, uh, to suit unique requirements. Meaning to say, if you know that one of your components, for example, needs special tailoring to, well, then you can use instructions and embed them into your DR plan 
and Food Stack Disaster Recovery will consider those instructions either during pre-checks or the full execution, which means, or which brings me to the next step or the next feature, monitor and manage live DR operations. So not only can you set up a DR plan and DR protection groups with full stack recovery, no, you can monitor its execution or their execution when in progress and you can even pre-check them if you need to. Pre-checks are particularly important because you don't want to find out that your DR plan doesn't work when you need it. You want to check before and do some dry runs, and that's where pre-check to validate DR readiness comes in. And if you do all, uh, if you use all eight of these features, if you do all eight of these things that I've described, you will be ready for full stack DR in the Oracle Cloud. Speaking of ready. I hope today I have shown to you how we can provide never down applications with Oracle Maximum Availability Architecture. The three aspects I want you to take away from this presentation today is that you can keep your applications running by storing the application state in database tables and hiding database outages from users with transparent application continuity. You can then protect your application state in Oracle database or particularly in pluggable Oracle database using Oracle Active Data Guard, per PDB Data Guard, Oracle Sharding, and other hidden gems of Oracle Maximum Availability Architecture. Last but not least, you can plan, configure, pre-check, run, monitor, and monitor your disaster recovery plans for your infrastructure, Oracle database, and your applications with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Full Stack Disaster Recovery so that you would be ready for any disaster that might strike and hopefully never will. With that said, you can try many of the features I've talked about today for free by going to one of these sources that I've listed here on the slide, particularly the developer oracle.com life labs, which demonstrate a lot of the features that I've mentioned today. And if you then have still questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is given below. Until then, thank you so much for staying with me. Enjoy the rest of the day and the event. Thank you.